born this date, 1944. And our co-hosts on the program, he's a two-star, Mr. Bill Stubblefield. And born before 1944? Slightly. Not Slightly, a lot. not a lot. Despite the joking and the kidding, <laughs> not a lot before 1944. Yeah. A little bit. A couple 40, months. Couple. What was it? 40? 40. 40. 40 even, right? 40 even. Yeah. yeah. And Mr. Gil Strap? Good morning. What year were you born? <laughs> 57. 57. I'm a 63-er. Yeah. Beginning of it. January 30. So I was... Uh, you were young. What, nine and a half months old at the Kennedy assassination, I think. Nine months, three weeks, somewhere around there. Yeah. An interesting day. That's one of those events that we'll always remember where we were at the time. You won't. <laughs> <laughs> Janet, Janet, I don't remember where I was. It was before consciousness, really. On a Janet uh, McNulty, our guest, or that's the voice you just heard in the background. Janet, good morning to you. Good morning. Yeah. Uh, uh, you just finished up uh, your uh, latest political foray, and you run for Congress, you run for Senate. You're moving your way up the ladder. Presidency is next, I presume. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, hell, we'll have to freeze over first. Not going to happen just yet? <laughs> yeah. Uh, what do you think about running for office? Uh, what, what do you like about it? What do you not like about it? And don't say not winning is what I don't like about it. But uh, not winning is what I don't like about it. Yeah. <laughs> no, honestly, if you want to know how the political process works, you want to know really what's going on locally, nationally, run for office. You're going to learn a lot. Not just how much money you have to spend or just don't want to spend because I chose to stay on a budget, but you're going to figure out people who can trust, people who might be able to help you. You're going to learn where people stand on the issues. You're going to figure out what issues really are important and not just what the media reports. Mm -hmm. Not to mention all the paperwork you get to file. Why? Yeah, you, you've been <laughs> off a, pretty, a couple of big, big uh, chunks of the apple there in the offices that you were running for. You, mm -hmm. you, you kind of went big or go home in those situations. Why go big or go home right away? Ever since I was a child, people told me start small. Take baby steps, slowly work your ways up. And I did that for basically 18 years of my life, and it shows for it. I never got anywhere. So I figured if you're going to do something, do it. You never know where you're going to land. You never know what's going to happen. I was pretty certain what the outcome would be, obviously. I didn't have a lot of support when I ran, and I didn't have much money. But, again, I've reached the point where you go big or go home. Fair enough. So at the end of the process of running for politics, did you come out of it more or less cynical than when you went in? I would say probably a bit more cynical. Oh, well, then you should post in our audience on Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I have things to do, so I try not to be on social media a whole lot because mm -hmm. you can find yourself scrolling through Facebook for about two hours and then wonder what you were doing. For the offices you ran for, did you seriously think, did you even consider that you'd win? I thought maybe if there was a gigantic miracle, there is a chance. Sometimes the unknown and the impossible happens. Mm -hmm. But it really depends upon the electorate. It depends on how angry they are at their current representatives or senators. It depends on what they want, but it also depends on how many people show up to vote. And unfortunately, we have very low voter turnout. Yeah, I'm an advocate for the, the small office, if you will, for two reasons. One, it enhances, you have a better chance of winning. Also, I think you have more of an impact upon your the constituents, uh, say county commission, county mm -hmm. council, uh, or then or even state senator or the, or the delegate. So, so I'm always a little surprised how serious, or I'm always curious how serious someone that is running for a national office for first time out of the uh, the barrel they are. So. When I choose to do something, I do it, and I do it to the best of my ability. I always have, even if the odds are against me. Because I moved around a lot as a child, I tend to be more nationally focused. I've lived in a lot of different areas. Um, when I ran for delegate, Mr. Overton told me a bit of advice to choose what you're focused on and go for that. So I did some thinking and I figured, well, I know a lot about the country. I've been in the Southwest. I've been in the Midwest. I've been in really tiny towns that only had a population of 3,000 people. So I've gotten to know the country in a way and how different people groups of people work and how we're all different as Americans yet all very similar. So I took his advice and I ran for national office since that tends to be where my focus is. I also just didn't like the people running. <laughs> <laughs> The thing about Janet is you can never tell where she is on an issue. She couches, she hedges, she beats around the bush. You just don't know how she feels. Yeah. Uh, you also have been, uh, since uh, 2011, writing books. Yes. Yeah. How many have you pumped out? I have about 25 novels and about 24 kids' books. That's astounding. Mm. Yes, I got bored. <laughs> <laughs> well, you have a stack of books in front of you right now. This is my latest series. It's called the Enchained Trilogy. Hold that up to um, your camera there so we can see it. Can you see it? Yeah. 
So this is the first book, Enchained. And I have the series completed for those who are interested. This is mm -hmm. book number two. And this is the final book that I published last summer. Okay. And the theme? There's a lot of themes in it, but it's mostly a character-driven story. It's about a society where people are not allowed to have emotions, and our character literally had her emotions beaten out of her. She's been turned into a robot, or so the people in charge think. And when she gets out of this military training facility where she has spent her whole childhood, has been completely secluded from life, and she is actually forced to go into the real world, she starts to realize that things were not as she was told, that maybe she wasn't told the whole truth, and she starts changing. She starts feeling things. She starts feeling compassion and mercy, and she doesn't know what to do with it at first. And that's really the focus of the story is as she tries to reclaim her humanity. Um, the second book, I add a little bit more mystery and thriller type suspense. I don't really want to go into that too much mm -hmm. <laughs> because you do want to read the first one to kind of get the gist Should, of the Do second. you need to read them in order? It would help. You can start with the second or third, but she makes it because it's all told from her point of view she'll make a lot of references to the first so it does help if you start with the first one because the whole story is one complete story the each book literally picks up where the last one left off but i had to split it into three because it just got to be so long you can't publish a 1400 page book and how did you publish the books kdp amazon kdp um, i also did it through draft through digital um, smash words basically self-published how much money do you need to have to get a book published you can do it for nothing, but if you want quality artwork, it would be in your interest to hire an artist, which is what I did. I found an artist on Fiverr to do the artwork for me. I learned how to use software so that I could do all the formatting myself for ebook and print. But if you want it done professionally and you don't like working with software, then you might have to shovel out a couple hundred dollars for someone to do the formatting for you. Now, our colleague, Mr. Gilstrap, uh, has a reputation of killing everybody off. Do you do the same thing? <laughs> Only certain people <laughs> who, who pay for that right <laughs> handsomely. Um, well, yes, if you, want a, if you want a story that has impact, unfortunately, this isn't a happy story. So people are going to die, including people the character cares about. And I'm not going to tell you who dies. You have to read that. But also, the bastards that deserve it do get what they deserve. <laughs> <laughs> so there's some vengefulness in there. All right, John, author to author, go get it. So where's the, where does the idea come from? I mean, there had to be a night or a time when you're sitting around saying, okay, this is eating me alive. I've got to start writing it down. So what's the, what's the kernel that starts it? I can't say exactly where the idea came from because I got it when I was completing another project of mine. So I put this one on hold for a while. Sorry, I'm not used to microphones. <laughs> <laughs> I put this one on hold for a while because I was completing a science fiction adventure series and I can only work on so many projects at one time before you start getting them all muddled together. But I guess it's the idea of this woman who was raised in a military-like society and turned into a fighting machine having to run a gauntlet and fight every day of her life just wouldn't leave me alone. So eventually when I finished up my previous project, I wrote what became chapter one, though I probably deleted it about three times before I got the one I liked. And I figured, okay, fine, I'm done. Because I was not ready to start another writing project at the time. Because this took me seven years to write. Mm. And, but it wouldn't let me go. So the next thing I know, I wrote chapter two. And then before I knew it, I had five chapters and 100 pages. So at that point I decided, all right, this project isn't letting me go. I can't get the idea on my head. So I just kept writing until I had about 1,400 pages of story. So you didn't release them one at a time? You released them all at once as a trilogy? I did do one at a time. I didn't have the whole thing written when I released the first one, but I did have outlines all the way up through the end. But when I got to the end of the first book and I still had a lot more story to write, I realized that I was going to have to break it up into separate books anyways because since you do do, since I do print on demand, um, they only let you print books up to a certain length. So otherwise it just becomes too costly. So I just broke it off. I found a point where I figured it was a good place to break. And then when I got the second book finished, which I was almost done writing by the time I published the first, I just found a break. I, I just had to choose it because, again, trying to publish a 1,400 page hardback. I mean, who wants to hold that? Yeah. Now you said print on demand. What does that mean? Well, that means through Amazon KDP, your book. Kindle you, Direct Publishing. Yeah. Is what. Sorry. Kindle Direct Publishing, what it is, is you upload the files, but the book is not printed until so many places in order on the web page that Amazon sets up for you. Gotcha. Yeah, for the listeners, there, there's, there's two distinct worlds that have developed over, over the years. One is the traditional publishing model, which is the one that's existed forever, of which I'm a part, where you publish your 
buys the manuscript and editor and you know, take care of all of that. And the one that has developed more recently is is the independent publishing or self-publishing. It, it, it's many different names for the same thing, which is where the author um, finishes the project and then is pretty much responsible for every step mm -hmm. along the way, from cover design to editing to the to getting the the book pushed out. My question to you is: Did you consider the public the traditional route? first or did you go straight to the indie? I did consider the traditional route with another book that I had completed over 10 years ago but I either never got a reply to my inquiries or I just got flat out rejections at that point somebody a friend of mine told me about Amazon um, Kindle Direct Publishing it was new at the time it had just come up and I just figured what did I have to lose I wasn't getting anywhere trying to go the traditional route and if I don't get anywhere going the self-publishing route at least I tried what about your children book? You say you've written a 24 kid book, a children book? I believe so, yes. Uh, the Is there a uh, common theme among those books? It depends on which ones you read, but for the most part, I, I tried to keep my kids' books just fun to read. I didn't really want them to be serious. I have one that's a rhyming book. It's called Rhymes A Lot. It's kind of dumb, but. <laughs> <It> makes sense. <laughs> but um, it's just a quirky, funny little book about you know different people in a town and some of the different things they do but there is no real theme to it because I just want it to be a fun story you could read with your child and what is your target age well that one as far as the kids books the target age can go anywhere from three or four up to eight years old so it because I have the Mr. Chili books which are probably a little bit more older and again those are just more fun books but they also they do cover more persistence and the first one the character Mr. Chili is trying to make chili he fails each and every time but he keeps trying so that's sort of the theme of that one do you write getting your, hungry again with these food references <laughs> <though>. <laughs> yeah. can you write your children's book and your adult book at the same time Yes, actually, I've done that. Mm -hmm. That's how I got so many besides being bored. One in the left hand, one in the right hand. <laughs> just, it's like it playing works. the piano. Just <laughs> pumping them out. I am slightly ambidextrous, so yeah. No, really. Can you throw with either arm? Mm -hmm. I'm no. not very good at it, but I can. Yeah. Uh, are you truly ambidextrous if you're not good at I throwing said, with either arm? Though? I said slightly. But I can. <laughs> <laughs> and that's only because y you have to really practice, but I can write with both hands. Well, that's pretty good. I don't think I could do anything with my left hand in regards to writing if just wouldn't if the right one doesn't write well enough for the left one to even compete uh so uh, how are the book sales going what, what has been your best selling book that really depends month to month to be honest Some how about month, overall cumulative totals what, what i book think did overall you and it's not this series necessarily overall it's my mystery series that seems to have the best selling books who's your mystery character it's called mellow summers mellow summer mm -hmm. okay and and that one so if with, for an independent publisher, what's a good number of books to sell that make you go, oh, that was pretty cool, that's a good number? The way I look at it, depending on how much marketing you're able to put into it, which is a huge gamble anyways, if you can get 10 sales in a month of your paid books, mm -hmm. you're doing pretty good, especially if you're not able to pour a lot of money into marketing, which I have not been able to lately. Mm -hmm. But it, it, it depends on what you're going for. Some people are able to get two to 300 sales a month. Others are lucky if they get one or two. The way I figure it, if you're able to get a little bit of income to supplement what you're getting, you're doing pretty well. And if you're able to put that money back into the marketing of your book and get more sales, then you're doing pretty well. Now, what do you ask for a hard bound, hardcover bound book like that? Based on the cost of printing, this hard copy is going to cost you about $35 because you, I spend about $20 in printing costs per book. So and then the you'll, rest of you'll it, net about 15 out of that book? I actually net about 3 or $4. Three or four because it's not just dollars. printing. I have the fees I have to pay for the company I go for, mm -hmm. and then there's service fees and just everything else, plus return processing fees should people want to return the book. Is that worth the amount of time and effort and energy it takes to write a book to net $3 per book? If you want your book published and you can't get through the traditional publishing route, then yes, it is. Otherwise, it'll just sit there on your hard drive. So can I, is it safe to say that going the route that you're going, the satisfaction is in getting the job done and finding some folks who will buy the book as opposed to getting rich from it? Yes, you don't write books to get rich. Some, some people do. Some do, but let me put it this way. Very few authors do get rich. Some get lucky, but very few do. Mm -hmm. And also, I, I'm going to guess the vast majority of your sales are ebooks. They are ebooks. Yeah. Ebooks are Where a hot they, selling. 
<laughs> and and the costs associated to you with ebooks are vastly less. They're way less. If you, I probably because the um, delivery fee that Amazon has, because it always depends upon the size of your file. I probably only pay about seventy cents to a dollar for right. per download. I charge five ninety nine for these particular books. So I'm netting at a seventy percent royalty rate, about two seventy to three fifty a book. Okay. Do you have another series in mind that you're going to do? I don't have one in mind right now, but I'm sure I'll get one eventually. But I did take a year off from writing because mm -hmm. I spent seven years writing these. I've basically been writing books for 13 straight years. I needed a break. So you ran for office. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I did. So Twice. tell us about, I'm going to move into my wheelhouse a little bit. Let's talk about the, the mystery thrillers. Mellow Summers is the name? Yes, so it's called it, the... Amateur sleuth, or what's? She's just an amateur sleuth. She's a college student, um, basically moves to Vermont, and uh, ends up moving to an apartment that happens to be haunted by the previous resident. So are they horror type? No, they're just cozy paranormal mysteries. Okay. Does they're more fun, flirty. I don't. They're not serious books. Let's put it that way. I try to keep them more fun, lighthearted. Mm -hmm. Each book is probably two hundred pages or less. Okay. Do you have an author that you model yourself after or, who, or an author who inspired you? I don't have a particular author who inspired me. I do read a lot of books. I know I read Tolkien as a teenager. I obviously read the Harry Potter books. And, don't uh, say it that way. I, I love the Harry <laughs> Potter books. To. I'm proud I of my to. Harry Potter books. I, when they became a thing, I swore I was never going to read them, but I found myself reading them. Became a pop culture phenomenon, <laughs> right? Uh, you, your book... Uh, your, your trilogy that's in front of you right there. Um, do you, and I asked John this question the first time we interviewed him as well, I believe. Do you envision that as you're writing the book, do you envision a particular actor playing or actress playing the role of your main characters as you write the book? I don't. Not a particular actor, no. My books play like movies in my head, mm -hmm. but I don't envision a particular actor playing the character. Um, now that it's finished, though, do you, if someone came to you next week and said, hey, we've got a movie deal on your books, who would you think in your mind would be your lead character? I don't know who would be the lead character, to be honest, because she's 18. And I think as far as who's playing her, maybe somebody new who's looking to break out would probably be best because they would give it their all. Mm -hmm. You know, they wouldn't have that resume with the whole, oh, I'm a lead actor. I've got this huge resume. I've made a lot of money. People are going to love what I do. But someone new playing the character Nani would give it everything they have to bring that character to life. Now, as for some of the side characters, there's a character named Luther in the story. He's an older man, kind of serves as a mentor to her eventually. Idris Elba would play him very well. With the accent or without? Oh, with the accent. It's very sexy. With the accent? <laughs> Yeah, because I've seen him in a couple of different roles, and uh, I, I kind of—I I probably depends on how you first saw that person. But I first saw Idris Elba without the accent, so that's oh, really? kind of always the way that I, in my head, that I hear him, right? Uh, so, how do you know a book is done? You honestly just know. I don't know how else to describe it. When you have nothing else to write, nothing else to say, and you have effectively tied up all the loose ends, it's done. John, how do you know when you're, one of your books is done? It's the exact same answer. Sometimes it's just, um, sometimes it's a surprise. You realize, okay, this is, well, there's done and then there's done. The story, the story ends for me when you just realize, okay, this is exactly the right spot, and, I, and it's always a surprise when it ends. It's either it's either a line or a piece, a bit of action that happens. It's just this is the perfect spot. Mm -hmm. That's not when the book's done. The book's done. Then when you go back, and then you know that the polish to make sure that it's. I should have maybe it, said when then when the story is done. Yeah. Or I was yeah. going to say when everybody's killed off. <laughs> yeah. There's nobody left. Only to kill. certain people. <laughs> <laughs> Only the ones that deserve it. Yeah. <laughs> so, but that's but that's part of you know. I asked a, a painter friend of mine um, that same question, and it comes. I think anybody that's that's involved in an artistry kind of thing, uh, there is a point in a snow scene if if you're painting a, a landscape where there's there's one too many leaves on a tree or there's one too many snowflakes in the in the snow scene one too many bodies scattered in your book yes <laughs> or 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 one one too many um 
words. Janet, I have 60 seconds left. How do folks get uh, one of your books? I have a website, uh, mcnultyjanet.com, that you can go to. You can look me up on Amazon. Just type Janet McNulty into the Amazon search bar. All of my books will come up. Spell McNulty for our radio audience. M-C-N-U-L-T-Y. Just like it sounds. Yep. If you were to recommend to one of your uh, potential purchasers of a book what book they should buy to start with out of your collection of books, which one would you recommend? If you want a serious book that's character-driven, uh, I would definitely recommend Enchained. If you want something that's fun, flirty, and you don't really need to think about it, do the Mellow Summer series. I got 15 books in that series. Good answer. Hey, good to see you in a non-political role. <laughs> you you know, you laugh more when you're not running for office. Did you know that? I'm more nervous when I'm running for office. <laughs> oh, good stuff. Thank you for coming in. You're welcome. Thank you. Janet McNulty, and we are back with a final minute here. This segment.